Amen, amen. Appreciate that, Brother Paul and Brother Dwayne and Miss Stephanie. I appreciate you this morning, and I'm thankful this morning for the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, we're, we are having children's church this morning for those that will be going there. For the rest of us, if you would stand with me and turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Scripture reads there in Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. He says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And some fell on stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell on good ground and brought forth fruit, some hundredfold and some sixty and some thirty. Who hath ears to hear, let them hear. I want you to skip over with me to verse 24. He said, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that sowed a good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blades was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householders came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. And the servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and the same, or in the time of the harvest, I say unto the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you this morning. We thank you so much for the time of worship that we've had. I'm thankful, Lord Jesus, that we're able to gather here in your name and to lift you up through song. And Lord Jesus, I'm thankful that we can reflect upon our blessings we truly are blessed today. Even in the difficulties, we're blessed. You're a faithful God. You're a God who works in our hearts and in our life. You're a saving God that reaches down to the, the gutters of life. And when we call on you, you pull us out of those gutters and you place our feet upon the solid rock. We're thankful that because that you're alive today, we can face this old world not only can we face this world, but we know we have hope beyond this world to be with you forevermore if we trust in you as our own Savior. And Lord, that's why we believe what we believe. We do believe in you. And Lord Jesus, we do believe in the Father. We do believe in the Holy Spirit of God today. We do believe in the crucifixion in which the sin of humanity was dealt with and the debt was paid. We do believe in the resurrection where death, hell, and the grave was conquered. And we do believe that you are coming again soon and very soon. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you would just work today. And I ask you to hide me behind the cross. I ask for a, fresh, for a fresh anointing of your spirit to preach. And I pray you'd save the lost today, whether they're here or listening or watching, wherever the sound of my voice may go. I pray there's one lost 
that they would come to know you. And I pray that you would do a work in our hearts as us who are saved. And we'll give you the praise. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I want to take just a few moments to look at these. Thank you. I'm about completely cleared up, but still a little bit want to hang on. <clears throat> but as we look here this morning out of Matthew chapter 13, Jesus found himself by the seaside and the multitudes gathered unto him. And understandably so. I mean, Jesus of Nazareth had been going throughout there of Jerusalem and throughout Galilee and, and different areas there. And, and he was performing many miracles. I mean, people were hungry and he was feeding them by the thousands. People were sick and afflicted and he was touching them and healing them. Folks were dead and he was raising them back to life. Folks had things like a withered hand and he made them completely whole. Some folks were blind and he made them to see and some were deaf and he made them to hear. John says that the world cannot contain the books that it would take to talk about all that Jesus had done. And I don't know if that amazes you much, but it does mean not that I am amazed by the fact that he'd done all those wonderful things, but what amazes me is that God seemed fit to just give us this much. And, and, and that's what amazes me. And when we think about it, the 66 books that make up the Bible, the inspired and errant and fallible word of God. And, and in fact, when we think about that, not just this little book, but you could go a little step further and think about the fact that the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is what God has given to us and which is plenty sufficient for us in the here and now for all eternity to, 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 for us to know what Jesus did in his earthly ministry. Yet John says that it, the world couldn't contain the books when I think about all that Jesus did. But with that said, you can understand why people wanted to be where he was at, right? And, and when people showed up, sometimes it wasn't always for the right motives. I mean, some people wanted just to be, you know, observers of what's happening. They've heard about it, but they want to see with their own eyes. There were some other folks that were looking to benefit from the things that Jesus were doing. I mean, if you were hungry, you want to show up to where a man fed 5,000 with a sack lunch, right? Uh, 5,000 then, 4,000 another time. I mean, Jesus knew how to get to people's hearts, right? And it, through their bellies. If somebody's hungry and you want to talk to them about some spiritual things, you better get to the physical aspect first. And Jesus understood that. You know, there was folks who were sick and afflicted. Jesus understand their, their, he understood their um, physical ailments and he ministered to them. So you can understand why the crowd was there. There was also folks there that just because of Jesus' claim, not just as a miracle worker, and that was evident through what he did, but what he talked about was the fact that he was God in the flesh. He is the promised seed of Genesis 3.15. He is the Christ the New Testament translation of the Old Testament word Messiah, the, the, the anointed one. When we talk about Jesus, folks, he was not just a prophet. He was the prophet all the other prophets were speaking of. He is the word of God. He is the one that came in the volume of the book. He is God in the flesh. He is the savior of the world who ultimately would go as the sinless sacrifice and to pay for our sin debt and then raise himself from the dead. So Jesus, as he is there at the seaside, folks gathered and they wanted to hear what he had to say. And he gathered in such a way that he had to get up out on the boat. And as he got there on the boat, everybody else stood there on the shore and then he spoke unto them. And, and you know, that's it's, to me is amazing too. I know that sometimes they, folks try to explain, well, it's kind of like an amphitheater. He's on the boat and, and his voice carried because of that. And that may be the case. I don't completely know. But I know this, if I'm out on the boat and everybody's out there and I got a pretty big mouth, it'd be hard for me to hear. But we talk about God, folks. We're talking about when Jesus speaks, uh, he don't have to have a microphone. I mean, he can speak and everybody's going to hear, right? If he can feed 5,000 with a sack lunch, he can speak and whisper. 
and everybody around can hear him if that's what he wants to happen. And so he is speaking as the multitude is there. But as he is speaking, he's going to also speak in a manner pretty unique, I guess. He spoke in what we call parables. We're talking about, you know, life-type stories that had spiritual meanings. And so he's going to speak in such a fashion. And you might say, well, why would he do that? Well, what's the, what's the significance of that? Well, if, before we get into those two parables, verse 10 says this, the disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For, what, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and to him that hath more abundance, but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear, and shalt not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand what with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and for your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. And so Jesus is speaking in parables, and they ask, why are you doing this? And he said this, he said, the folks that have gathered up here today, they have dulled their own hearing, and they have closed their own eyes. And because of that, I'm speaking a way in which they will not understand. They may see it, but not perceive it. They may hear it, but not understand it. Now, when we read the passage of Scripture, I think what you have is, is, is two things. You have some folks who have willfully ignored the Word of God, and therefore an act of judgment of God has come upon them. So I want you to hear me today. Don't take lightly the opportunity to hear from God and respond to God. Don't let your ears grow dull of hearing. Don't let your eyes become, uh, uh, you know, uh, blind to seeing. Don't let your heart grow wax cold and hard and, <clears throat> and not willing to receive the word, folks. Because when you close your eyes and you close your ears and you harden your heart and you stiffen your neck, then guess what starts happening? Whether you're a lost person you continue to resist the Holy Spirit of God. You continue to ignore the Word of God. You may eventually die without God and open your eyes in a place of torment to one day be cast into the lake of fire. And for you and I who are saved people, listen, even as saved people, folks, you and I have responsibility to hear the Word, understand the Word, see the work of God, perceive the work of God. Also, to not let our hearts get hard to the Word of God, or our necks get stiff to the Word of God. Well, we don't want to be in such a place where we're not seeing the work of God and hearing the work or not recognizing. And sometimes God's doing the work. And you know what I've experienced over the years in churches amongst the people of God? That there'll be God doing a work and you would think everybody gets it and they don't. You don't. It's almost, if you ain't careful, the more that God's working, it's like sometimes folks just don't get it. They don't understand it. They think coming to a worship service, going home, eating their Sunday dinner, taking them a Sunday nap, and going about their business is just what we expect. And don't get me wrong, I like my Sunday dinner. Huh? You say, well, you don't act like it. You preach long enough. I just let y'all let the lines die down. Well, no sense in waiting out there when you can wait in here, right? Hello? You know, 
and then I like my nap. You know, I do. I enjoy a Sunday nap. I don't know why I feel so much better on Sunday afternoon, but I sure enough enjoy a Sunday nap. But let me tell you something. I don't look forward to Sundays because I'm going to eat good and sleep good. I look forward to Sunday because it reminds me every single week that we serve a risen Savior. And he's alive today, and he's speaking today, and he's working today, and I anticipate that in my life, and I also desire to gather with the people of God to sing praises to his high and holy name because he inhabits the praise of his people, and I want to be a part of that. In this passage of Scripture, we've, we've talked about several things over the last several weeks. We've We've talked about revival. We've talked about meaningless lives, right? Last week, we talked about how life is, in, is vain apart from God, how that, how that Solomon said, listen, you can try everything in this world, but it's empty, it's vain, it's meaningless, it's purposeless. There's, no, there's, no, there's absolutely uh, no substance to it if God's not in the center of what you do. It doesn't matter. Your work, your education, your power, your prestige, all those things, your health, all those things that we have in this world we consider blessings. He says, you know what they are? They're meaningless. Oh, fulfilling the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, everything that this world has to offer and you gain it and Jesus is in the center of your life, all those things are absolutely meaningless. He said the whole purpose of man this is the whole conclusion of the matter, is that man should fear God and keep his commandments. And when God's at the center, then all those things that are here can have a real significance and purpose. Not just in the here and now, but for all eternity. And so we've talked about revival amongst the church. We talked about having a life of meaning, but I want us to think about something this morning. And I, I just want to look at these two parables. I'm not going to try to spend a whole lot of time as I could in these two parables, but I wanted to, to, to just put them together for a minute because I think, I think that the church is, 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 it seems that we're looking for something like a revival. But before we can have revival, I think there has to be some more conversion. And you say, what do you mean by that, Brother Anthony? Well, this is what I mean. I can't see the heart of a man. I can't. I made mention of that in my Sunday school class today because we have a political leader, a governor of our state that claims that he's a Christian, probably in church this morning. Um, loss is a goose and a whirlwind. And if you don't believe that, you don't pay no attention. Okay, you can't believe the way you believe he believes. You can't stand the way you stand. You can't promote the things you promote and say he follows and trusts in the God of the Bible. It's just a contradiction. It's an oxymoron. I can't see the heart of a person, but when you open it up for me, <laughs> it makes it pretty easy. And I say that to say that I can't see anybody's heart in this room. And I can't tell who is watching or listening through the different outlets that we have to get the word of God out. But I serve a God who knows the heart. And also we each one know where we stand with God. And we might do a good job at tricking other people and even deceiving ourselves from time to time. You know what I'm talking about? We can do that. I mean, there's times where we, we go about thinking we're okay when we're really not okay. And then there's times we realize, you know what, I'm not as okay as I thought I was. But we can go through some times where we are self-deceived, where we think we're okay. And we do a good job of deceiving others as we're going about life. And that's a whole lot about our culture right now. I mean, social media has just has, has made that, uh, you know, just so easy, right? I mean, you got a fake book out there. I mean, everybody and their mom's got the grandest life in the world until they start spilling the beans out there on fake book. But a lot of times what happens is you get folks out there in the world. I mean, they, you think they got the best life ever world, you know. 
Julie said sometimes, she'll say, how come you don't say this about me on Facebook? I say, you think I believe that stuff that people put on there? Hey, when they start pumping up their spouse like that, I'm thinking they in trouble waters. Huh? I mean, hello. Maybe you got the grandest one ever was, but let me tell you something. When you start having to convince everybody else about that, I have a hard time believing you all right. Huh? Most time out there in them places, man, it ain't all what it seems. It's like what Alma said, just because it glitters, it ain't gold. You know, it don't necessarily mean it's gold. But anyway, I say all that to say that, that that's how we, we are in this culture, in this world. We want to make ourselves out to be. You see, not everybody is rich just because they look like it. Huh? You know, I know some folks that got a whole lot of money and for whatever reason, live like they got nothing. I don't quite understand that. I don't know why you should have to live above your means, but if I got a ton of money in the bank, I'm not living like a pauper either. But I've met people that that's what it looks like. Look like they got the same pair of clothes they wear every single day, live in the same little house they've always lived. Maybe that's why they got the money. All they've done is stuck it in the bank. But there's a lot, you can't always go off appearance. And that's what this par these parables are about. And the first parable I want us to see here is this. Not everybody that has an experience is born again. That's what the first parable is about. And let's look at that for just a moment at the beginning of chapter 13. As the multitude is gathered around to hear what Jesus has to say, he starts with this parable. As he spoke many things unto them in parables, he said, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now, Jesus is an awesome storyteller. I, I'm not an awesome storyteller. He, he was an awesome storyteller. And so he get their attention, and he would tell them stories. But Jesus didn't just tell stories to tell stories. He told stories to give a meaning and a truth. And he told these stories to some folks in, in a manner so he would hide the truth from them. It was part of a judgment. They didn't want to hear, and, and they gathered together. Remember, the crowds come, and he knew why they were there, right? If you look earlier in John, in John I believe it was chapter 2, it says that he was doing these miracles, and it says many believed, but he did not commit himself to them. Why? Because he knew their hearts. They believed the miracles that he did, but they didn't really commit to him. They weren't following after him, and so Jesus did not commit himself to them. And so Jesus knew why the crowd was there. He knows why you're here today. He knows if you're here just because it's what you've always done, you know. I mean, we played ball yesterday, and we played a long time. The rain backed us up, and you know what time I got home? About 4 o'clock in the morning. You know what time I went to bed? About, I don't know, 4.15, 4.20, 4.30, something like that. The time I got up, 8.15. He said, well, why'd you come? Well, you're the pastor. Well, that don't mean I've always wanted to get up. Now, this morning, God's given me the ability to get up, okay? There's been plenty of times I went to bed real early on Saturday, and God trying to wake me up on Sunday. I'm thinking, Lord, I don't feel like going today. He said, you got to go. Huh? Well, a lot of folks just stay in the bed, and I'm like, I got to go, right? I'm glad to be here this morning. I don't care if it's four hours of sleep or 40 minutes of sleep. I'm glad to be here this morning. But as I think about why we come, some of it's just out of pure habit. Some of it's because you got obligation. You know, you're the preacher. You're the preacher's family. You, you're, you're a deacon. You should be here. Your family should be here. You're a Sunday school teacher. You're supposed to be here. You, you're a worship leader. You have some other type of capacity in which you serve. You ought to be here. You shouldn't just be here on the days you're doing things either. You should be here pretty consistent because you're a leader in this church. You should be here. And you ought to be motivated by those responsibilities to be here. But at the same time as you should be motivated by those responsibilities, I want you to understand something. Just because we do those things don't make us always hear the right reason. Okay? Some people show up for whatever reasons, and I don't know those reasons. I'm glad you're here, right? And God's glad you're here, but he also knows why you are here. And he says to these group of people that's there, he knows why they're there. So he speaks these parables and he's a good storyteller. And he said, behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell on the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up. And some 
fell upon the stony grounds where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, and because they had no deepness of the earth, and when the sun was up, they were scorched, because they had no roots, and they withered away. And some fell by the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others, they fell to good ground, and brought forth fruit, and some a hundredfold, and some sixty, and some thirtyfold, and he says, who hath ears to hear, let them hear. So Jesus starts out with this story, and he talks about the sower and the seed. Now, when you first read the story, I don't think it sounds anything real profound. Now, I grew up on asphalt up there in Cincinnati. I grew up in an apartment complex. I did not have a garden. I did not sow any grass. I did not cut any grass. Where I lived there, they had people that took care of those types of things in this apartment complex. So I didn't know anything about any of those type things, really, uh, other than, just, you know, just basic stuff that you learn at school. But I didn't try to grow anything when I was growing up. And, and so I didn't quite completely understand exactly all the process, but it doesn't seem like it's anything profound here. There was a guy that was sowing some seed, and some of it fell over there on the wayside or on the road. And, and it couldn't grow out there. And the birds came because it didn't get to go down in the ground and they ate it, right? That's what happens. And then he says, but then somebody sowed, this guy sowed the seed. And as he's sowing the seed, some fell on the ground over here. The birds came. Others, it was real rocky soil. And so, yes, it looks like it grew for a while, but it didn't go very deep. And because it didn't go very deep, when the sun came in, it burned it up. That's just common sense. This other guy, as they're sowing it, some of that seed fell over there by the thorns. And as it so, was, was sown there, it started to grow up. But all of those other stuff, the thorns, the briars, all, all of this stuff choked out what was trying to grow there. They took all the nutrients, and that makes sense. And he said, some of the seed fell on some good soil. It was deep enough. There wasn't any type of thorns around. It didn't fall on the wayside. It was able to sink down into the, the ground. And because of it was in good condition, it grew up. And there was some fruit that was produced. And some of it produced more than others. And I can imagine as Jesus is telling this story, folks are probably thinking, what's the point? I don't understand what he's getting at. We come to listen to him say something. And this is what we get. A story. It's just nothing profound about it. But when Jesus begins to explain to his disciples, not to those listening, but to his disciples, he gives this explanation. And I want us to hear this before we move on to the wheat and tares. This is what Jesus said. He said in verse 18, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. Have you ever been to a worship service, heard a sermon, been in a Sunday school class, been in a Bible study, the word of God is preached, the word of God is taught, the word of God was sung about, and you left out of here thinking, I don't know about today. I didn't get anything out of that. Now, don't get me wrong. I've listened to some preachers. I thought to myself, they can't preach out a wet, wet paper bag. Okay? I, I've heard some. You might think that about me from time to time or every time. I don't know. But I've heard some. And, and I've heard some that they can't teach either. And they're supposed to be qualified to do that. But at the same time, is there some of those out there? There's been plenty that teach the word. And if you're not careful, that word don't take root. Maybe you're sitting there today and you worried about what's going on when you get out of here. Maybe instead of be focusing upon the word of God and what God's trying to say to you, you're concerned about what is going to be your lunch or when are you going to get to take a nap? And all those other types of things that you may have been going on today because you got 
Things like this. Well, I don't get any other day off but on Sunday. I don't get uh, this or that or this is my day for this or for that. And so you're focused on other things and the word of God is snatched from your heart. Or maybe you're sitting there, but you're not understanding it. And the scripture says here that the one who hears it but doesn't understand it is that the wicked one comes into and takes that word from their heart. You know what I'm talking about? There's plenty of times if you're not careful. You can be right there in the word and all of a sudden it's like, it's just gone, snatched from you. You say, I don't get that. I don't understand that. I, this isn't speaking to me today, you know. Hey, this Bible's a lie, folks. And let me tell you something. I did say that some folks can't preach well out of a wet paper bag and they ain't the best teachers, so on and so forth. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You don't have to be the best. This word right here handles its own, okay? If you had to be much, I wouldn't get to preach. But God, his word stands on its own. And so if it's simply the reading of the word prior to the sermon, that should be enough, folks, for you to get something from the Lord. But when you leave out of here nothing, that means you've allowed the enemy to snatch the word from your heart. The second one, he says, is like this. But he that received the seed into the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy received it. Or they hear the word, and then all of a sudden, they are excited about what they hear. They receive it. But he says this in verse 21. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while... For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. He said, there's another person that's in the audience where the word is sown, because that's what the seed is, and it falls on that stony ground. And, and that person is the person that, that the word falls on their hearts and they are quick to receive it. And I, I first started preaching, I call these folks quick wicks. It's like those firecrackers that you have. Man, you light them, you better throw them. You know what I'm saying? Because as soon as you light it, it's like, pow. It's, you light it and throw it, or you light it and run. Well, that's how some folks are in the church. Oh, man, and they get all pumped up, excited for about two seconds, and then they explode, they're gone. You don't know what happened to them. You know, I was pumped up about it. I thought, man, this person's got saved. This person's come, come live for Jesus. This person's walked the aisle. They went through the baptismal waters. And next thing you know, you can't find them anymore. See, what happens is these types of folks, they got no root. The word comes in. They have an emotional experience. They're excited about what is said, but it doesn't really take a deep root so all of a sudden, when you start living for Jesus, how many understand that there's some troubles that come along with living for Jesus? There's some trials that come along with living for Jesus. There's some spiritual warfare. There's a battle of the old man. There's just struggles in this world. When you start living for Jesus, your eyes get opened up to something. Well, these folks thought, hey, I want to live for Jesus. But they didn't understand what really came along with that. So when the troubles come, because there's no real deep root, it says there that they were offended by it. That means they, they, they couldn't handle this world. And all of a sudden, they just disappear. And the other group of folks where the seed is being sown, the word of God, and this great multitude of people that were there, they, they were the folks that were like the thorns. He says, or the, the thorny ground. He says, he also <clears throat> that received the seed amongst the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the seedfulness of riches choked out the word and became unfruitful. And let me tell you about this group. This group's a little different than the ones before because the ones before gladly received it, but it didn't take any real root so when the troubles of life come, they got offended and they, they quit walking with Jesus, right? 
Uh, I'll give you an example of those groups real quick before we move to the thorns. I, I, I think I may have shared this before. I was pastor in my first church, and we, we go up and down the holler that was there, knock on doors, invite people to come to church, and so on and so forth, and, and we'd run a church bus, and we'd, we'd do different things like that. And one day I was uh, talking to somebody, and was there at their house, and, and telling them about Jesus, and, and this lady was excited about what we were talking about, and, and I'd been there several different times, and, and anyway, she receives Jesus. At least she goes through the motions of such. And she seems to be excited about it. And she says, you know, I'd like to have something that, uh, you know, maybe can help me as I, I walk with Jesus. And so I gave her a book by Charles Ryrie, and, and, and it, was, it was just giving some basic, you know, new believer type things that you need to learn and, and that type of thing. And I can't remember, even remember the exact title of the book right now. But I gave her the book, and she began to read the book. And I came back there to check on her. And she said, you know, I was reading this book and this guy says that if you get saved, you know, you have to learn to forgive. And she said, I just can't do that. She said, some, some stuff's happened to me in my past my husband doesn't even know about. And there ain't no way I can forgive. And I'm not going to forgive. Well, Scripture says, how can you be forgiven for all that much that you have done if you can't forgive the little things that happened to you? And you might say, now, Brother Anthony, you don't know what happened to that lady. You're right. She didn't tell me. I have a pretty good idea, but she didn't tell me. But ain't nothing that you've ever been through or I've been through compares to what we put Jesus through. And if Jesus is willing to forgive you and me and cast our sin as far as the east is from the west and into the depths of the sea of forgetfulness to remember it no more. Guess what he asks us to do and commands us to do? You learn how to forgive like he forgives. You say, I forgive, but I ain't never going to forget because you ain't never forgave. Now, I'm not saying it ain't going to be in your brain, but if you think that you're going to bring something up every little time you turn around, you never forgave in the first place. It's one thing to forgive somebody, battle with remembering what they did as you try to move forward, than it is for you to hang on to that. That ain't true forgiveness, folks. And if you don't like that principle, you have to take that up with God. And that's what she did. And, and after that point, oh, she won't come back to church and doesn't do nothing. I think that's part of what we have with the stony ground. This other group with the thorns is like this. You're hearing the word. You know and what it's saying to you. you. You may be getting convicted about something. You may be directed into something. But then all of a sudden, as you're thinking on making a move for the Lord Jesus, some other things start popping up in your mind. If I start living for Jesus, then what if I have to change certain things in my life? If I start having to change certain things in my life, that's going to affect other things in my life, right? Hey, I start living for Jesus, some things in my relationship is going to have to change. I start living for Jesus, some other practices I have is going to have to change. It's tax season. Huh? How many ever thought about cheating on your taxes? It's not okay. Hello? You like to pay taxes, Brother Anthony? No, I don't like to pay taxes. Uh-uh. I don't like it at all. But I pay them. Huh? Well, you know, you can justify a lot of things on why we do what we do. Huh? What about business owners? What about some of these folks up and down the road here? And you think about these different business owners. What about these folks running these gas stations around here? Well, you just, can you imagine they get saved? What are they going to do with all them stinking machines they got in there that all these folks are going in there and putting their money in? That they're robbing them? Hello? Maybe you go play them slot machines. Shame on you. Huh? Hello? You know, you went from preaching to meddling again. Sometimes that's what happens. Hello? I told you I wasn't the best preacher, but I met a little bit. Hello? Huh? I don't know if that's an instrument. Is that Dwayne? That's a mandolin, not a meddling, is it? My bad. That's right. That's right. If you're from Cincinnati and then Clay County, it's meddling. 
not a mandolin. But think about that. Think about that for a minute. What about folks who know I need to give my life to Jesus? I want to serve him. I'm about to. And then all of a sudden, the thorns of this life choke out the word of God. There's a lot of folks hanging right on them pews. There's a lot of folks that know what they need to do. And about the time they're going to do it, they're like that young rich ruler. Jesus, what do I got to do to have eternal life? He, he says, hey, you keep the Ten Commandments, eternal life. He said, I've done that from my youth up. He said, you done good, son. Just sell all you got, give it to the poor, and come follow after me. And that young rich ruler just turned his head, and he walked off. All tickled death wanting to know about eternal life. All about trying to keep the Ten Commandments. But when Jesus said, put your idol down and your materialism and your money, you can't serve God and mammon, you can sell that, you've got to turn from that, and you come follow after me, the guy just don't even think about eternal life no more. He's stuck right here in the here and now with the riches he's got. And he, he, he allowed the, the riches of this world to choke out the word of God, at least at that point in his life. What about us? That's the same type of people. You got folks that, that don't hear the word at all. You got some folks that have emotional experience but no root. You got some folks that allow the world to choke out what God's trying to say to them. But then you got some folks that have the good soil. That, that soil that receives the word. He, he goes on to say, but he that received the seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, listen to what it says, understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, bringeth forth some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. That's why when you talk about somebody's life, I tell you, I can't see your heart. You can tell them about the fruit, but I want you to understand something. Somebody have more fruit than other fruit. So it's hard, even as fruit inspectors, Right? It's hard sometimes to tell. Some people are going to bring forth a whole lot of fruit and some not so much. But they still receive the seed and it did take up some root. It did germinate. It did produce some fruit. That's the one that truly got saved. When I first learned about this parable and was studying it, I, I was trying to figure out, did the first person get saved? Well, no, they never received the word at all. What about the second person? Stony ground, it appears so, but he said it took no root to burn up this left. The other one, we know the world choked out the word, so it didn't get to do anything. It's not till the last one where you have true conversion, folks. That's why you can say all day long, I walked an aisle. I went through the baptismal waters. I taught a class one time. I preached a sermon before. I've done this, I've done that. I don't mean a thing in and of itself. I give money when it comes to the offering plate to come around, and I, I've done this and I've done that. So what? Hello? Those things are fine, good, and dandy when you're truly born again, but those things mean nothing except you truly are born again. And so... In this passage, we find out of the four different examples, we have one that we have a real change. And that's why quickly I want to just read this parable. I'm not going to expound on much. But I already read to you about the wheat and the tares. There was a person who sowed some good seed into his field. While he was sleeping, an enemy came and sowed some bad seed. And so when, uh, when, this, when it begins to come up, the servants see that there is some wheat and some tares growing together. And they come to the master and they say, Master, didn't you sow good seed? How come we have this mix of wheat and tares? And he said, it must have been an enemy that done this. And, and he says, okay, do we go out there and separate the wheat from the tares? And the master says, no, don't do that. We'll wait to the time of the harvest. And I'll tell those that are harvesting, the reapers when they're harvesting, then to separate because if you're not, you're not careful, you'll end up plucking up the wheat with the tear. That's the story, right? That's what he said in essence and that I already read to you. 
So when we skip over a page or so, he's going to give some example or give an explanation, rather, and it starts there in verse 37. He said, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. So here's your explanation, right? There you go. Jesus sowed the seed. The field is the world. The good seed is the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the enemy. The enemy is the one that sowed the, the bad seed. That's the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And then the reapers are the angels. He says, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The son of man, <coughs> the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And you say, why are we look at those both today? Well, I told you that I think that revival is something the church needs, but you know why I think there's a little interest in it? Because we need something a little more first. If you're not careful. You might be one of those people that received the word on the stony heart. Oh, you had an emotional experience. Brother Anthony, I came forward at a Bible school. Did you? I came forward at, at a Bible camp. I came forward at a youth event. I came forward at a revival. I came forward whenever. Or I prayed at home. Or I did this. Or I was sitting in my car, driving down the road, listening to Christian music. And I pulled off the side of the road. And you had this emotional experience. But you never had no real fruit. I, you started having little troubles. You never really been committed to Jesus. Oh, you might come to church here and there. You might come to worship service here and there. You might participate here and there. You might carry a Bible around. But that'll make you born again. But you're on the church roll. You got baptized. You move your letter from somewhere else. You, 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 whatever. You on the church roll. But you know what? When the books are opened up, let me tell you what book ain't gonna be opened up. Some local church roll. It ain't gonna be opened up, folks. And that's a good thing. Because ours a mess, Susie said. Huh? Ain't you glad we ain't separating the wheat from the tares? Huh? I mean, you, you start trying to look at some of that stuff, it's man a lie. How you know where's from who to who's from who? And what's from what? I don't know. Can't find them anyway, most time. Maybe you're the one that's there that man, you, 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 you here, but you know what you need to do, but every time you think you know what you need to do and you're trying to live right, but man, when you start thinking about following Jesus, the cares of this world choke it out. But you think you're all right because you're better than the next person. You may even be more faithful than somebody who's on the church roll. Huh? But does that make you born again? No. Does that make you prepared for heaven? No. But does that mean that you're amongst the people of God? I told you before, before I got saved, I showed up to church, and I don't know where somebody, uh, when, I, when I got saved, I said, well, I didn't know you was even lost. You come to church here? I saw you carrying a Bible. I never corrected him. I, like, I didn't own a Bible, so I didn't carry one. I started coming to church at First Baptist Church, South Lebanon, in May of 1998, hit and miss throughout the summertime. That'll tell you what the expectation is, the average church member. If they thought I was faithful, before I got saved, that's a problem. Hello? I mean, come on, folks. 
We think we show up to church there at, uh, 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 once every blue moon and we're an active church member. That's a problem with the Constitution bylaws in most churches. They'll say the folks that can be involved in business meetings are active church members. You know what started to have to happen over the years? Is they had to start being real lenient on the definition of active in the church. There ain't nobody qualified to vote. Hell out. Couldn't ever get a quorum. So they just said, well, if you can breathe and you got here, at least within the last year, if you'll come, maybe you can vote. Hello? The tares grow amongst the wheat. But I'm going to tell you something, and I'm going to close with this. There will be a day of separation. And when the separation happens, folks, there'll be no mistakes. Jesus describes it in another way of a separation between the sheep and the goats. Gonna put the goats over here and the sheep over here. Those that are born again, they get to go glory. Those that have never been born again, they don't. They'll find their place in the lake of fire. That's what he just said. He said, at the end, when he comes, he's gonna send forth his angels. And they're going to separate. And, and let me give you an example of that another place. And sometimes people mess it up and they try to talk about it being the rapture. But you get over into Luke and you get over to Matthew and there's a separation. It says there's going to be two in the field, one taken, one left. There's going to be two in the bed, one taken, one left. Matthew don't, don't talk about it exactly, but over in Luke, they say, well, where are they going, Lord? That's what he says. He says, where the eagles are, so shall they be. So you say, what does that mean? When you go to the book of Revelation chapter 19, you know what's going to happen when Jesus comes? He's going to split the eastern sky, riding upon a white stallion, and it's going to say, Lord of lords and king of kings. And he's going to have fire in his eyes. He's going to pull the sword from his mouth. And guess what? There's going to be a gathering there at the Valley of Megiddo and there's going to be all the armies of the nations of the world there to come break war against the Lord Jesus. And guess who's coming with him? The church is coming with him, but then also an angelic host. So, so what we have here is this. After that battle, all those folks that thought they were going to overthrow, they're going to die. And there's going to be carnage up to the bridle of a horse's mouth in that valley. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Think about that. That's nasty. Don't think about that. That's going to be nasty. They're going to mess up your lunch. You're going to eat here in a few minutes. You know that, right? I'll mess up your lunch. You say, you've already did it, Brother Anthony. I'm not even hungry no more. You've preached so long. Well, that's good. I helped you lose a little weight today. But guess what's going to happen? Then after that, after all that carnage is there, guess who's he's going to call there? All oh, the fowl of the air. So I think when, when, when Matthew and them, Jesus is talking about one take and one left, you know what he's doing? At that time, now we're talking the end of the age, right? Church already been raptured, okay? Church has already been raptured, removed. You're talking the Gospels. Church age hasn't even started yet. The mystery of the church, he mentions the church, but the rapture has not been talked about. That's later. So what's he talking about over here? At the end, Jesus is going to come. His angel's going to come with him. At the end of the tribulation period, guess who's took? The one that's going to be judged. The one that's going to be facing death. The one that's going to be out there in the valley who's going to be their carnage is going to be eaten by that of the fowl of the air. The one that's left, who's that? Well, it's going to gather the elect on the four, four corners of the earth. It's going
going to be those that survived the tribulation period that's going to go into the millennium. That's what's who that's going to be. And you say, I don't know if I were, just check it. Just do a little study on it for a minute. And you'll find that out. We, we take a verse or two over here and we try to apply it to something it never meant. And if you take that verse, then all of a sudden you got Jesus talking about a rapture that's happened way after tribulation period. That's not even what he's talking about. He's talking about those from being removed at that time going to be the judge. That's what he said, separate the wheat from the tares. That's what's happening right there. It's going to be a great separation. What about you? What about you here? Are you a wheat or are you a tear? I don't know. But you do. You do. You know if you're really truly born again. Let me tell you something, folks. You can claim the name of Jesus all you want to. But if you have no concern for the things of God, the word of God, the worship of God, the people of God, the work of God, there's a problem. Hello? Either you've never been born again or you are far away from where you need to be in your walk with your Savior. And you in the flesh. But you've got to determine that. That's why Peter said you make your calling and election sure. That means you know that you know that you know that you are saved. And if you're not saved, humble yourself and come to Jesus. It don't matter to me if you're the preacher, the preacher's family, a deacon, a deacon's family. It don't matter if you're a teacher. I don't care if you're founder of this church. I don't care if you've been coming here for a long time. I don't care if you testified, sung. You know what? Every preacher ought to be saved. Amen? Ought a deacon ought to be saved. Every, everybody ought to be saved, right? It don't matter. Humble yourself. Make your calling and election sure. It'd be better to come walking out and somebody say, well, I thought they'd always been saved. And then know you're going to heaven, then trick everybody here and find yourself in the lake of fire. Don't do that. That's a terrible mistake. Right? What about you? I'm going to ask Miss Stephanie to make her way up. And those are going to help with the invitation. What about you today? The word is out. What kind of soil is your heart? Like the wayside? You think of asking you to get out of here. Let's go. You like the stony ground? Oh, you pumped up about it, but you ain't no root. Are you like the thorny ground? You know what you need to do, but man, he cares that the world's choking it. Got in a headlock. Huh? Where's it going to be the good soil today? As you're sitting out there, am I part of the wheat or the tares? You know, those wheat and those tares, they look a lot alike. What happens when everything's grown up and it looks very similar? When they start to harvest, you know what they do? They take that wheat, they take those tares, and as they start breaking them open, guess what? Only the wheat has some real fruit in there. The tare don't. And so when they start raising it up and the wind blows and, and, and the seed and the grain, what's supposed to fall to the ground, that only comes out of the wheat but everything else just blows away. What does he say? To bind that up, he said, throw it in the fire. What good is it? What good is it to try to fake it? Listen, you hear the old saying, fake it till you make it? That don't work. That don't work after this life. Huh? You might trick and make it way here, but one day, Reality's going to set in. You can't fake it till you make it when it comes to God. What about you? Let's pray. Father, we bow before you during this invitation and ask you to move in a way only you can. Save the lost today, Lord. Show us our hearts. Help us to be able to, to not only hear the truth, but receive the truth and then respond to the truth. Lord, I ask you to move in a way that only you're able to move as we seek you. We ask you to move mightily in Jesus' name. Amen.